my colleague Cooper, um, who helped us at Instagram with a lot of this stuff. So uh, thanks, Cooper. Take it away. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for this great event. And thank you, South Africa, for having me. Uh, first time here. Really loving it. So I've been at Facebook for a little over five years. I've uh, been across many different teams. Quite regular, uh, as Jonathan just said, I've been focusing on Python, uh, the push to move to Python 3. Um, we're roughly almost at half of our code. If you include Instagram, we're probably half of all our Python is Python 3 now. Um, mainly to get a benefit that I'm going to talk about today and you know, move to the latest and greatest. And when we're all on the latest and greatest, uh, we can push Python to go sort of where we want, uh, which is handy. Oh, this. <laughs> how, how did that get there? We'll get back to that important slide. I think, I think we're about three out for 150 or something. I was just looking just before. Um, I'll be at the test tomorrow as well. Um, so who am I? I'm Australian. I love sport. Naturally, I just talked about it. I'm going to walk over here because no one really has. Um, <laughs> this is our lovely sponsor. Um, and I've done many, wore many hats at Facebook. This isn't going to work now, is it? Ooh, it did. I've been on many different teams over the five years, and this is one of the cool things and why I've enjoyed my time at Facebook. I sort of started at SRO, which are our site reliability offices, where we're basically the firefighters, and I have many stories of kill uh, personally killing Facebook and bringing it back from the dead. Um, I was in NetEng for a while working on a whole range of IPP6 stuff. I sort of then FBOS is our open source switch that we uh, built from the ground up using Broadcom Silicon. I was on that for a couple of years, and lately I've been on the Python Foundation, and I'm looking to move to our Terragraph team later this half. Um, so with that flexibility, lots of different stuff, um, but as I said, uh, Python stuff of late. Um, sort of order came up, and I didn't mean it to. Um, that was an Alan Donald's favorite day back in 99, but it was a good day for me. I remember little Cooper very excited. Uh, thanks for the World Cup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back on topic. So I'm going to sort of talk about um, where we use Python, because everyone always comes to me and goes, how are you in the Python team at Facebook? You're a PHP shop. I know you do a little bit of C++, a lot, and uh, Java House. Um, but we use Python for all our, a, a lot of automation, a lot of smaller internal services. Our, uh, our RPC framework is all Thrift, Apache Thrift, which we have open source, but not all of it. There's some internal stuff. Um, and Python's used all over. There's glue and, sm as I said, small servers and things like that. Um, we're going to talk about that Python 2 is deprecated. It has been announced that the core Python developers are not adding any new features to Python 2. It's all uh, only backported security fixes from now on from the core team to, 20, to PyCon 2020. And they're going to announce there that it's end of life. What's really probably going to happen is there's probably going to be some MariaDB-like forks, and people are going to go, screw you, Python 3. We're going to stay on Python 2. But um, the core team will not work on it anymore. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why we've, why we've bothered so much with Python 3, sort of the, some of the wins we've had, uh, how easy it is to get access to Python 3 now. I look across many common operating systems, and it's basically everywhere now and easily accessible. You won't have to build it from source. I know a lot of people don't like doing that. And I'm going to do the cardinal sin of a talk and try and do a very small tutorial at the end showing you the process we've taken to convert our code using unit tests as the primary driver and type annotations to sort of move to Python 3. We don't really use type annotations. We use type annotations once you become Python 3. Um, but you, uh, Dropbox, for example, uh, they, they're trying to do the opposite with using type annotations to type all their code and then move to Python 3. Do it. OK. So if you want to do this and DDoS the, the uh, Wi-Fi, the code that I'm going to use is up on my GitHub. Um, you can check it out and run the unit tests and see it and try, sort of play along with what I do. The readme.md. Uh, does have uh, the sort of steps that I'm going to take in the tutorial. Uh, it's very quick, but it's just to get the point across of you know, how unit tests do make it kind of really easy to move to Python 3. You can do it. All right, I'm going to come back over here because this thing's going to drive me crazy. Oh, now it's doing too many. OK, so I think I'm here. So people always want examples of what we use Python for. My favorite one's the top one because I worked on it. It's our uh, BitTorrent distribution system. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Uh, following on from the last talk quite nicely is FBAR, which is our Facebook automatic remediation system. It is all in Python. Um, very hard to open source because it's completely Facebook code and just too, too, too tight integrated. Uh, but I'll roughly say what that does. 
MPS is uh, our automation suite for all our MySQL, or Maria. Uh, we're, we're a hybrid in the middle of between MySQL and Maria. Um, but it automates turning things up, promoting, promoting uh, slaves to masters when masters die, moving things around when we need to drain racks. Uh, it's, the the D DBAs have thousands and thousands of lines of Python built over many, many years. Uh, and they've come a very long way from when I joined and we used to run uh, SQL scripts manually to promote masters and all kinds of scary things, and it's nice that those days are gone. Uh, Tupperware is like our Docker. Uh, we've been working on it many years. There's talks on it if you want to know more about it. But the config files to generate your Docker instance or our Tupperware jobs is all written in Python. Uh, and then there's a, a lot of data science and machine learning now, and their libraries are always good fun to keep up to date and you know compile and keep up to date, but they're, they're doing crazy things with Python and eating a lot of CPU time. So FBPKG, I promise I'll sort of explain what it is. Uh, it's a, uh, our BitTorrent system that runs in every data center across Facebook. This sort of graph shows the very spiky nature of uh, the announcers to the BitTorrent tracker. Uh, the big spike is generally when we do a big push to our web fleet every day, and there are lots of other smaller web fleet pushes, but that basically just shows the size of the swarm across. And this would be hundreds of thousands of, of nodes all across our um, uh, infrastructure doing it. I kind of lie when I say it's all Python. We do wrap libtorrent. Uh, libtorrent's still so mature, it would be silly to reinvent BitTorrent logic. And there was Python bindings, so we asynchronously talk to that and download torrents using libtorrent. But it was cool. As a teenager, I sort of played with torrents to share Linux ISOs. And because <laughs> I'm just a good open source guy. And uh, then I got paid to do it at Facebook for a half a year. So that was pretty cool fun. Um, but yeah, all our, the CEDARs, uh, the clients downloading everywhere, and um, all uh, sort of the, the CI stuff at Facebook, all written in Python 3, the CI for this system that does end-to-end -end testing. Um, sort of some cool stats, you know, hundreds of thousands of hosts to it, terabytes coming out of our CEDARs all the time. Uh, it's scary how much uh, petabytes downloading, because the swarms are what saves our backbone so much, and that's why we love BitTorrent a lot. Uh, and it's all IPv6, uh, which was the reason why I started playing with it, because we've built IPv6-only networks now, so I had to make sure that this stuff all worked with IPv6. So FBAR, at its very, very simplest for the automatic remediations, if you want, if Oracle wants to take this code, it's free. Um, <laughs> um, but the, um, the alarm up there says that the disk, uh, the disk is full in the simplest form. We run a check to make sure that the alarm's not a... Uh, a false alarm, because they do come through from time to time, some bad checking or something in fires, and then basically, you know, you'll fix it. Um, a very simple ex uh, thing, there's all rate limits, and all, and all <laughs> that's, I would never put that in my Python program, but, you know, it's a demo. Um, so, yeah, in the simplest form is that, but a whole range of rate limits and per host tier, and, you know, you only want five to be worked on in an hour, you can set that. That's the hard part that I heard, the, like, working that out so you just can't kill your whole tier. You can do per tier settings with FBAR, and it's, FBAR was started before I joined in, like, I think late 2011 in this bunch of shell scripts and worked its way up to be where it is today. Instagram, we all know it, we all love it. Uh, it did the big migration. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it today because there's a great talk up on YouTube from Hui Ding and Lisa Guo, both Jonathan and my co-workers. Uh, they talked at PyCon US last year and said all the things that they did, uh, which is basically similar steps than we're going to do today, but I'm going to do a more practical sort of demo and talk about the reasons and how easy Python 3 is to get. But that's a really good talk. Uh, I'll get these slides to Jonathan to share so we can, don't have to write the links down or whatever. So I've got a few. A lot of people don't know, but Instagram is Django. Uh, it's not using all the features it once was of Django, uh, but it's still at its core uses it to do all the endpoints and, and route around the traffic to the right, the right code to do it. So uh, big users, very recent version. Um, it's Django. We all know this gentleman. If you don't, it's Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python. Uh, this was him announcing that there will never be a Python 2.8 and when the uh, Python core team were not going to put any new features into Python 2. Uh, as I said, it's only security features going back, so you're basically sitting on legacy code that's never going to get any love uh, unless you fork it yourself and, and, and go and start adding features. Where are we at with Python 3? So, little secret, before Python 3.5, Python 3 was actually slower than Python 2. So you had the burden of converting, and then for free, you got slower code. So it was a very hard sell. Um, it looked grim for Python 3, 
Uh, this is why languages like Go, Rust, all these things sort of got a lot of sway and a lot of people went and rewrote their programs in that. Uh, but we found by going to Python 3 and using this sort of unit testing method, you don't reintroduce bugs that you had years ago in your Python code by rewriting in new languages and stuff. Um, but we're kind of at 3.6.4, came out in December. 3.7 is well underway. The feature freeze has happened. I don't know. If you ever want to know how a Python release goes, they completely document it in what's known as a PEP, which is a Python enhancement proposal, I think is the acronym name. It's like a RFC for Python. Uh, they're all up on the uh, Python web page, and you can just Google PEP uh, Python 3.7 release, and it tells you all the time frames, who's responsible, who's doing it, and it has to be approved by Guido and a few other like custodians or what does he call himself, the benefit, bene benevolent dictator for life. Um, and so we should expect around June this year. They're normally pretty good with the time frames because they're very uh, pushed out and my coworker Wukash has tried to get that sped up but the Python community moves a little slower. Um, so they should hit June six, around June, uh, we should have 3.7, which has even more performance gains over 3.6. Um, they're really trying to hammer down the performance of Python without breaking the API because that didn't work so well. This is Wukash, this is, he's, a, he's one of my coworkers. He is the uh, core co Python contributor, and he's actually going to be the release manager for Python 3.8 and 3.9. So he's signed up for a lot of work and a long time support. Um, big lover of Python, an amazing coworker. Um, I'll re um, so Python 3 is moving and moving fast. So what's the big deal? Why, why, why am I here to talk to you about Python 3? Hand up here who has Python in their infrastructure. That's good, I thought it'd be a very high percent. Now, keep your hand up if it's Python 2 only. Okay, that's it. so the rest of you have Python 3, that's pretty cool. That's showing it's moving. Maybe I, we just finish early and go for beers then. <laughs> I'm cool for that. Um, but did uh, anyone see wins from like moving from Python 2 to Python 3 or were they new projects? Sort of yell out. New projects? That's where I see, so that's good. You're at least running your new projects in Python 3. Um, We've seen many wins across like Instagram. If you watch that talk, I'll go into more detail about it, but roughly around 10 to 20% CPU wins. And this is sort of without major rewrites using new async IO features or you know, totally rewriting the threading logic or trying to do anything smarter that you can do in Python 3. Um, so as I said before, sort of Python 3, 5, 3, 4, uh, Python 3 was slower. There's been a whole range of um, reference count enhancements, garbage collection enhancements. Um, and many other wins um, that have just allowed for C Python itself to be smarter. This is sort of a, a great example here. Uh, Wukash tweeting, he was recently working on FBAR, the system I sort of talked about, automatic remediations. It runs across many, many, many uh, container jobs because it has a lot of servers to look after. Um, and we've seen here about a 4x drop in CPU and half a drop, uh, and a 50% drop in memory. Uh, basically, the things that we've seen here and worked out why. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more on the talk. Python 3 is like a generator and iterator first core library where you don't actually return a list and stick it all in memory. You just yield each object as you iterate through it. And compact dictionaries, uh, because dictionaries are used everywhere inside FBAR, uh, have saved all that memory usage. So you can get crazy wins by these smarter implementations of the standard objects and standard functions in Python alone. The memory wins, if you want a big talk about knowing how compact dicks work and some of the other wins, Raymond Hedinger is another core developer. Uh, he invented this whole compact dict uh, mentality. I should say dictionary. Um, uh, <laughs> it's Australian accent. Uh, <laughs> uh, he has a great talk at PyCon something, or oh, I think it's actually a talk in San Francisco somewhere, and he explains it in really good detail, and you can sort of see how simple but yet clever his implementation is. Uh, I thought it would be much more complex. So I'm going to sort of go through some more of the benefits of, of Python 3 now. We think the big one, uh, especially as your code base gets really big in Python, who loves going back to old Python 2 code? It's at least better than Perl. But who likes going back to old Python 2 code and you're looking at a function and you're like, what the hell is this variable foo? I have no idea what it is passed in, so you have to trace back the function, see whether that gets created, see what object it is, work it all the way through and go, ah, that's some name tuple I made or something like that. Uh, with type annotations, you know straight away that passed into this de uh, iterator, uh, sorry, generator fib, sorry, it is an iterator, uh, fib, um, you know it's going to be an int, okay? And there is static analysis tools, and in my demo, hopefully, if it doesn't screw up today, we're going to run MyPy. Uh, which I talk at the side there, which is sort of now the de facto standard of type checking in Python. Now, at runtime, the, the types mean nothing. You could still pass a string in here, and 
Python won't blow up until you try and do a comparison or something, um, but you can still pass the type in. It's still a dynamic type language. There's no plans in 3.8 or 3.9 to do anything with the types yet, but who knows, there might be. Um, but I'm sure it'll be a configurable option to sort of turn on runtime type analysis or something along the lines. Um, but yeah, we've, I've turned it on a lot of old code, not even old code, like code only months old, turned on the type analysis, uh, plumbed up all my types, cleaned them up, and found bugs where I'm just not checking for a, a, an error case or I'm tr uh, always assuming that there's going to be a dict and not a null or something or a none. So you will find bugs and it helps stop bugs as you're writing. Now everyone's favorite when going to Python 3 is the whole Unicode bytes, byte arrays, and strings. Uh, in Python, Python 2 sort of did a botched job and just gave you strings for everything. It could be raw binary data, it could be a string. You don't have that, you know, if you've heard the Zen of Python, it's like a, a pep that tells you how you should write your Python delightfully and the good things to do. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, but this was the most implicit thing about Python. Your binary data and your actually uh, encoded and decoded data had no difference. You had no clue and you had to sort of guess. So now, in Python 3, you have a binary, so a B string, I like to call it, but it's a byte array, and it can be any arbitrary data. Um, so you have that different uh, types. In Python 2, if you needed to display Unicode characters, uh, you have to explicitly call it a U string, or you have the for future import that I'm going to talk about in a second that turns all your strings to Unicode strings. Um, but Python 3 is Unicode by default. You can use emoticons as variable names now. It's pretty cool. Um, but uh, I've never done it because it would be bad code. But uh, I've used it in CLI output, though. That's cool. Um, we're Unicode by default. And we try to stick to UTF-8. That's most systems' defaults now. Um, it seems to be the sort of de facto standard for encoding and decoding. If you want to know more about Unicode, it took me a while to sort of understand it. It's sort of a, a hard thing to do. There's a good, good uh, Unicode what the big de what's the big deal talk from PyCon. Uh, I'd recommend talking that out because I could take out the full 45 minutes on Unicode. Now, a very, popular, um, a very popular sort of feature that's came in 3.6 that's made a lot of people at Facebook like go, I finally want to use Python 3, is string interpolation. I was like, really? Of all the things it gets, the string thing's happy? But it saves typing and it, finds it, it's, it seems people like to save typing. So that does exactly the same thing in Python 3.6, except the F string's actually quicker. Uh, so they probably will be talking in the future to make this a default. We stole it from Ruby. Um, you know, Ruby's had this since the 80s or something. Probably not, probably not that long, but Ruby's had it for a long time. Um, but people have really loved it. So you can see, there's the car. <laughs> Another big thing that we sort of stole from, the, I guess, the JavaScript world uh, and, and some other languages is the whole async notion. Now, does everyone here know what, when I say the word gil, what the gil means? Python, Ruby, many other interpreted languages have what's known as a global interpreter lock or something along the same lines. Every time you access a data object, a uh, file descriptor, something, you have to hold the gil. Okay? So this is why when you multi-thread a Python program and you want to do some CPU work, you'll never go over about 102, 103% CPU. Because something's holding the lock, another thread can't actually ask for the CPU time, so that's why you're locked at that level. And that's why everyone says multi-process if you have CPU work, only thread if you've got I.O. blocking stuff. This is sort of the next level stuff on threading. I like to think of threading as like a, a round robin, give some CPU time randomly to each bit of each thread that's going around in Python. Async IO gives you the ability to sort of define when you want to context switch and say, okay, I'm about to do some IO. Please hand this coroutine off to the loop and go to another one that's ready to do something. And so you can get really good performance uh, at a low cost with async IO. So here, with just sleeping, this because there's two two things in this async IO dot, that should be a dot gather. Um, um, this will only take a little over six seconds to run because they're going to sleep at the same time in parallel because of the async I.O. gather. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff with async I.O. Uh, I try to write everything in async I.O. to start with these days because eventually you get to some network calls or some I.O. that you can wrap and, and reap the benefits of the speed and get around the gill. I just put another good talk there from Wilkash. He, he gives good talks. Um, as I was saying about the standard library, a lot of the functions that you now uh, used to call that used to generate lists and you would wrap in len or something are now iterators, so be wary of that. And we'll sort of talk about that when we do some, some of the conversions. If it is a, an iterator or a generator and you call len on it, you're not going to get a response. You have to uh, explicitly cast it to a list or a tuple or whatever object you want. Um, 
be wary of that, but it gives you a much less um, memory footprint, and that's how you can get wins like we saw sort of with FBAR. Try and code generator first. There's also, uh, there's a few more than these, but these are some of the coolest sort of extra debugging tools you get with Python 3. Trace Malik allows you to uh, trace how the Python allocator actually uh, uh, allocates memory. So you can try and see which of your functions is filling up or which thread's filling up or, or eating all your memory. If you have one of those rare Python memory leaks that are hard to find, Trace Malik can make that a lot easier. Fault Handler is a nice way to get stack traces uh, and keep your program running, so you don't have to raise an exception. You can put it in prod, say, dump a stack trace every time you get here, because I want to see what's calling this function or something along the lines, and it just logs out the standard error. Or you can put it somewhere else if you want it to go to a file or any file descriptor. And then we now have dtrace probes, which we're starting to use a lot at Facebook to, while the program's running, use eBPF from the kernel to see all the calls and which functions are eating all the CPU or memory and syscalls. So really helpful stuff. This is Mr. Brendan Gregg, another Australian. Uh, used to work for Sun, is a D-Trace expert. I've never, like, if you ever want to know about D-Trace, just put Brendan, Brendan Gregg with two Gs and D-Trace, and he'll come up with some amazing talks about system performance. If you haven't read his book, an amazing book if you want to get better at analyzing Linux system performance. OK, so how do we get Python 3? I said that I've, I've gone through and sort of looked at some of the OSs today, Ubuntu. Everyone should just install 1804. You get the latest 3.6.4. They even alias Python as Python 3, which I saw in one of the talks, in one of the talks, uh, stack traces yesterday. Uh, I think it was Dom's. Um, it was a Python 3, even though he ran Python, because Ubuntu just comes with Python 3 now. Awesome. CentOS, yeah, that's what we run at Facebook. Um, 2.7.5 is the default that comes with the latest CentOS 7. Red Hat do backport a lot of security features and fixes from 2.7.11. Uh, that don't break the API and don't change default behaviors. Um, but it is a fair way behind. I checked EPL yesterday. That's why I guess I got a, a .za mirror. And uh, you can get 3.6.3 in EPL TA. So it's like one yum install and then the Python yum install. You've got Python 3 today. So CentOS is up there if you're happy to run EPL. Mac OS, once again, Apple have a sort of custom 2.7.10 by default. Uh, they have some extra modules included in user lib Python. Um, but very vanilla 2.7.10 other than that. Um, but if you're happy to install binaries random off the internet, which makes me feel weird, but I do it on my Mac, so it's only my laptop, um, you can have Python 3.6.4, and Brew is very bleeding edge for all, all things it sort of does. So Brew is amazing. Uh, everyone's favorite operating system. <laughs> is there a newer one? <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've uh, had it since I played Doom or something on this. Um, Windows is amazing for Python support these days. There's two core developers that are Microsoft employees, uh, Dr. Brett Cannon, and I forget the other dude's name, he's in Aussie too. I've met him, but I forget his name right now. Um, they're fully automated when the continuous deployment and the continu well, it's continuous, uh, not deployment, what's the other word that I've just forgot, the D word, delivery. Continuous delivery uh, bots build. The XEs for Windows are built same time as all the source devices and everything for Python, so Windows is up to date with uh, Python as it can be. Uh, so it's not a bad language choice for Windows, apart from then building your dependencies and things. It can be a lot of fun, as John down here knows. He works for Oculus at Facebook and their Windows shop. So how do we get to Python 2 and Python 3? Let's sort of go through the, sort of the tools. Now, I'm not going to just say this is the only way to do it. Uh, I just want to say this is a way that we've done it a few times now and sort of refined and found that it works pretty well and allows us to get pretty big code bases from Python 2 to Python 3, relatively bug-free. Um, so. We'll go through that sort of process now. As I said, you can follow along with the code if you wish. Um, but basically, the goals of this tutorial is we're going to um, turn on Python 3 unit testing after we see that our Python 2 unit testing works. Um, we're going to look at the failing tests and sort of evaluate why they failed. Uh, we're going to make the code Python and 2 ready. And then I'll talk about how you can run your tests in both Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, and then we're going to discuss after that sort of what you could do to then, once you're in Python 3 and you've cut your whole production over, you want to rip out all the Band-Aid code, as I like to call it, that sort of does the handling the Python 2 path and then the Python 3 path, because it's wasting CPU cycles. So once you move to Python 3, rip all that stuff out and move forward and enjoy all the, the hopefully free CPU wins and whatever you get. And then you get your nice bonus off your boss, because you're awesome. Um, there are some auto-conversion tools. They're Kind of good. Um, they do some stuff. It's actually good to run over some scripts for the first couple of times you do it, and it will show you sort of the, the common things that you need to change to go from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, one is Futurize. It's in the standard library. Um, 
you can uh, pull it out, uh, the mains in there. It, should, um, it will go over and run over the code. Um, it has a sort of, um, and then there's future, uh, which is another module written. And if you install that with pip, you'll get it added to your virtual env or your system Python path. And there's two stages with that. So stage one, if you run a stage one conversion, we'll sort of go and look for iterators that you uh, not explicitly know that they're iterators and wrap them in lists. It'll change uh, many little things that actually help you get on your first way to Python 3. And if you run a stage two import, it adds uh, these future imports, uh, which we're about to talk about. But that adds a depth on future. You'll need to install future into your virtual env when you deploy your Python app. So these future imports are a good thing to add to all your code first before you go to Python 3. Because what they do is they change some of the default Python 2 behavior to go to the Python 3 default behavior. Starting at the top, absolute import changes the way imports work to be like Python 3. You now have, you now have the ability to sort of import like Python 3 by going from dot dot module name import something. Or you have the like full, uh, you don't have to give the full path everywhere um, from, your, from your base module. Um, then division. Uh, Python 3's floor division. I'm not going to go into the difference. It's to do with rounding. Uh, division's kind of broken in Python 2, so please test your numbers and calculations if you're going from Python 2 to Python 3. Could cost money. Um, not going to say it has at Facebook. Um, the print function just turns it into being a first class function where you have to have brackets. That's one of the more annoying things that you have to fix in Python 2 to Python 3. Um, but I think it should have been there from the start. And then Unicode literals. And what Unicode literal does is turn all your strings into Unicode strings. Now, this could break things if you're actually doing Unicode inside your program. So be careful with that last one. The other ones are pretty, well, not division so much, but the print and the absolute import are generally uh, easy imports and then easy fixes. It's just fixing your import paths. Uh, Unicode literals can be a bit more difficult because Unicode's not that easy at all times. And division could make your numbers wrong. So be careful with those ones. Uh, we found enforcing not too opinionated, because uh, Facebook engineers are very sensitive to linters. Um, easing in some nice linters to help with the migration as well. Like we enforce those from future. If you do a Python 2 program, we enforce those from future imports and have for many years. Uh, I think my coworker Jason Freed came up with that idea many years ago, and that was awesome to do. So I, I highly recommend introducing those on all your Python 2 code bases and seeing what bugs you hit, and just slowly work your way uh, fixing them. Uh, there's just a list of the, the plugins we sort of use, Flake 8, Wraps, Pie Flakes. Uh, we have a sort of toned down uh, config file to make it not as noisy as it is by default. Bugbear's a custom uh, plugin we wrote to just do things that have caused us bad outages, so you can check that out. These are all open source, by the way. Uh, Flake 8 comprehensions has nothing to do with us, but it, it tells you uh, not to use dict uh, parenthesis parenthesis, rather use a, a dict literal and use literals because it's actually a lot faster for some reason. And I don't, Wukash explained to me why, but it went whew. Um, but it, it can make uh, just simple things and you get performance gains there. Flake 8 MyPy wrapped MyPy. And you'll see when I show you my uh, editor, um, in real time when I make a type error, uh, it will tell me. Uh, it's not a full recursive type annotation uh, check. It's only for the single file. But if you have the same function in that same file, it will say, hey, you're passing a string where it should be an int or something along those lines. Uh, but we'll talk a bit more about type annotating in a second. There's a from futures. As well as the future module, there's another module that is extremely popular in all the extreme uh, popular Python modules, like requests, et cetera, um, all those modules, is six. Um, it came from being two times three is six. That's the module writer's reason that he called it six. And it has a lot of those functions that will allow you to either gate code or wrap code in like a different function call so that it just works in Python 2 and Python 3. It solves a lot of the problems so you don't have to write try catches and catch things that can't import or et cetera and deals with renames of modules. So extremely uh, friendly modules, uh, helpful modules, I should say. So the, the big things that you're going to find, as I said, the print, the print statement is just annoying when you hit that. You're like, oh, I didn't put parentheses around it. Iter items to items. Who here has just always blindly used iter items because you read once on Stack Overflow, it's quicker? I did it years ago. Um, but uh, you guys must be better programmers. Um, <laughs> stir, uh, stir in Python 2 uh, equals, can equal bytes. So that's what bytes a lot of people. And in, as I've said probably too much in this talk, it's not an iterator first core library. OK, so let's go and look at this code and do a live demo, which is always scary. Is this one going to work? Yes, beautiful. OK. Turn off. And 
on mirror displays. The projector's just going to keep working. Look at that. OK. So just so you know, the editor that I'm using here is uh, Adam from uh, GitHub uh, with a lot of plugins. Um, uh, so just so people always ask that. Um, so I just have my very simple code here. Um, let's just go and go to my shell. And I'm just going to try and run it here to show that it works. Oops, if I could type. Uh, pi23.py. Pi and it's a very simple program where I just print some stuff out, show the types of a few things, and say that uh, you know, my echo of hello world matches. And because I've plumbed up correctly um, my test suite to, uh, in my setup.py, which you can see by easily going and reading the file, um, I can just run Python 2 setup.py test. It'll go and build my module, pull in any dependencies, uh, and run the test suite. So we go through, and what, and what we actually want to see here is that all our free tests pass. So the methodology that we used is to go and get good test coverage in Python 2, make everything pass, have nice asserts that show your math's correct, have nice asserts to show that your little crazy string manipulation regex of death works, and because um, we've all got them, and then you can sort of move it to Python 3. Now, this is as easy once you've got Python 3 now. Uh, just changing that to a 3. And off we go. This is 3.6.4. I guess my font's big enough. Can you sort of see it up the back, or do I now go bigger? OK. So let's look at our failed tests and sort of talk about what we've seen here. So I've called this test test iter items fun, uh, because the, the main thing you'll see a lot when you go from Python 2 to Python 3 is the use of iter items everywhere. Um, if you use Futurize, it will sort of uh, highlight this or fix it. I can't remember if it does, actually. Uh, it might. Um, but what it's saying here is we get an attribute error. The dict object does not have the attribute iter items. So let's go to our code and look where we call that. Oops. Iter items. And we can see here that we're just calling data.iter items. And I have here for the examples to how to do it in Python 2.3 and how I would then write it in Python 3. For Python 2, uh, for, to make it Python 2 and Python 3, I would use the six dot iter items helper function that basically takes care of call, trying to call iter items in Python 2, catching that attribute error that we saw, and then we'll run items on it because it does the same thing as a generator. So just comment out this for loop. So our unit test pass, and then we'll go and look at the next problem. And this is the, the fun and games that you get to play going to Python 2 to 3. Um, here we're saying that. Uh, the output that we've got returned is of class bytes, and what we want is of class stir. You'll also notice when you look at Python 2 to Python 3, the, the sort of keyword of type disappears. They gave up with that method actually that there is types, and everything's just a class in Python uh, 3. So if you lose the word type, don't be afraid. It's just a decision that they made. I don't understand why. Um, so let's go and look at that and see why what that function does and why we have bytes now. So it's a very bad written function, but it's called subprocess sub echo. And all I'm doing is calling subprocess echo and the string that I want to echo. By default, in Python 3, the subprocess module will always return bytes unless you explicitly say the encoding type that you want to use. So I'm using the six uh, if Python 2 logic. And you'll see if we're Python 3 in a second when I scroll over because my font's really big. Uh, I'm now just saying. All the output that comes back in standard error and standard out, encode it for me, please, so I get stirs. And what I would do, you know, once you get once your production completely moves to Python three, you would you'd get rid of that if statement in the three lines, and you'd save an if check. Yeah, Python three. Now let's see if my test suite runs. So ah. So now we're ready to start canarying it. And what we would do here with our, with our systems at Facebook is we, the term canary sort of means test it. So we would try and A-B test it, make sure there's no regressions, and sort of slowly phase it out to your production nodes. Uh, the other thing we'd sort of do here if there were databases or where you're saving your state, do some comparisons of the state saving in a shadow tier or something like that, because that data could differ as well. Uh, and then slowly do that. And as you get more confidence and you know there's no regressions, roll it out. Have that fun day where nothing goes wrong. <laughs> we, there were some, some boo-boos with Instagram, but we were able to drain and hide it. Like, but you know, this is the exact kind of process on a much bigger scale um, that we sort of went through. 
Now, the last thing I sort of want to show is uh, a, the program that I sort of said MyPy. Now, my program runs and does everything I want, and I'll explain why in a second. But if we run MyPy, so I have to use the dash dash Python 2 option here. Uh, MyPy itself is Python 3. But I have to use the Python 2 option because all my type annotations in my source file are the Python 2 comment syntax. There's two ways to type Python 2, the comment syntax, or there's new PYI stub files, they're called, or type annotation files. And they basically let you define in the Python 3 syntax the type annotations, uh, and you can just sit them alongside the same PYI file, and MyPy knows how to use them. So we go and run this program. It's going to go and do the recursive and check all the modules. There's only one file here. But we get the error to say, on line 105, the argument one has a type of int stir, and I expect stir stir. So let's go and have a look at what we've done and why it works. Because it's always interesting when MyPy finds these problems to then go, well, how did, how did this work at runtime if I had this bug? So we'll go to line 105. And you'll see here that I'm saying to print whatever returns from iter items fun, OK? And we're passing an int and a stir, OK? But it wants stir stir, so let's go and have a look. If we go up to iter items fun, why did you work? And the reason is, is because all I'm doing is you know, formatting a string. So an int implicitly will go to a stir with format. So it is nice to pass the right type. So let's go down to our function call and just the easiest fix here, but probably not the best fix is you can just wrap it in a stir. I would go and fix the dictionary in real life. This is less typing. Is it going to complain? So you can see here with our, the Flake 8 MyPy plugin that I said, in real time, I'm getting the type MyPy running on save, and it will tell me if I've got type errors, which is really helpful at times and tell me, but it doesn't seem to like that, so I'll fix it the proper way. Okay, and we should see now the type error has gone away. So if we reran MyPy right now, I should also have no type errors. We don't, hooray. But if we just look quickly, um, let's go and look at that function so the type annotations make, make uh, more sense. Not subprocess echo, this one. So you'll see here that data is a type, dix to stir. Pi version, I want an integer, um, and that's why I have the cast of an int in the thing next to it to check. Um, and uh, now uh, we also say underneath that we're going to return a stir. And this allows MyPy to give you all that, that helpful uh, information. OK. The demo worked. So that's basically what we did. Um, but you know, it takes a little longer on bigger code bases. So I've just included the slides for people uh, that will follow along at home. We've talked about MyPy. The next sort of thing you can do, uh, Travis CI is just one example. I've also done Bitbucket pipelines and the, and the likes like that, is you can move to Travis CI and have then your unit tests run in Python 2 and Python 3 very easily. It's just a YAML file, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, because my code didn't work or doesn't work in the repo as it is, I only have Travis running in, in Python 2, but it, that is as simple as you can do. The script step at the last stage is all the things you want to run and just ensure that they return zero. As long as they return zero, Travis is going to be happy. You get all the output. If you do get an error, you can go and check out. This will run on pull requests. And uh, whenever anyone pushes up a branch or um, any commit up to the, to the repo, and it even runs on forks, which is really nice for people who want to give you a PR or a patch request. So you're all now uh, Python gurus to go from Python 2 to Python 3. Uh, that's, you know, the speed increases, the memory reduction, and um, all the new features should, should be a, a big enough incentive. I'm sure the people that are writing Python 3 here already have uh, seen all the new features and used them. Uh, I hate when I have to go back to Python 2. It always makes me sad. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the process that we've taken, and I'll take questions. I hate standing behind a podium. Hi, so I've got two questions about scalability. Uh, firstly, how do you deal with the problem that you want to upgrade this thing to Python 3, but it depends on your other internal library, which also then needs to be upgraded to Python 3, which depends on your next internal bit? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how do you deal with the issue of 
as you're going through this whole process, which might take weeks, other people are still committing new code, and then you have this enormous merge problem. Yeah, okay, I feel you. Um, try and break it down and do like, you know, a library at a time and make it Python 2 and 3, and that way you can get smaller diffs in and get them in quicker, is one. Two, yes, you're just going to have to go back to those core libraries. So like a big blocker, uh, really early on when we first did so, the FBPKG thing I sort of talked about was one of the first, it and one other service, uh, were the first sort of Python 3 um, services at Facebook, and we had to do a lot of exactly that. Going back to core libraries, doing lots of little small diffs on the core libraries. If there wasn't unit tests, we sort of went, and we had to then test these core libraries, because uh, some of these were really old uh, at Facebook. And uh, we would just do the work and make them work in Python 2.3. Core libraries, I always recommend to leave Python 2.3, because um, uh, we, we can sort of tell with our build system what's using it, but it's never 100% right. Um, so just turning a core library into Python 3 only is risky. And I have broke people uh, as code by doing that. Uh, so I do recommend trying making it Py 2.3, and then sort of working your way up your dependency tree. There's no real easier way to do it, unfortunately. And that's one of, again, one of the reasons why it's been a slow adoption for Python 3, yeah, especially for large code bases. You do just have to recursively go through your dependencies and fix them. I don't have any magic answer there. I answered both? Yes? No. Cool. Uh, do you answer the second one? What we did at Instagram for the second one is we were shipping Python 2. It was running in production. But we started converting to Python 3. And every time someone would s submit code, we'd run all the tests in 2 and 3. And the rule was you couldn't make 3 worse. Like, it wouldn't run in 3. But if the same number of tests were failing before as are failing now, then at least you didn't make it worse. And then we'd, we'd basically. Yeah, so inc incremental updates. The same thing we did with typing. See, Jonathan has a, uh, the advantage there of a monolithic one, one project in one repo. On my generic big FB code repo, I can't do things like that. Um, because one team will just, it just doesn't work. Because like, there's hundreds of teams committing to this one repo. So that's a nice luxury I wish I had. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, I have a question about uh, pickling. Uh, we've got an issue. About what, sorry? About pickling. Like pickling? Yeah, pickle. yeah cool. Um, and we've got an issue, um, I ran into an issue where data that's pickled in Python 2 is unpicklable in Python 3. And it's an issue that we uh, kind of ran into. And I was just wondering if you have any advice or if you encountered what, what, that. What, what is the data that's not pickling in Python 3? This is when you're multiprocessing, or? Um, it's part of uh, a compression library. So under the hood, uh, they pickle um, the data into a string. And then um, we persist that. And mm -hmm. one of the issues we had was uh, when doing the migration, mm -hmm we simply wouldn't be able to um, unpickle uh, the data in Python 3. But I was just wondering if you had encountered that. Or we, we've encountered that where there's a, a function that used to return a, a string, but it's now um, returning bytes. Mm. And it doesn't know the encoding, so it can't be pickled as easy. Mm. Uh, you're 100% sure it's not returning a bytes or something like that? Possibly. possibly yeah, it yeah. could be that. Um, other than that, uh, some uh, iterators can get in the way. Uh, it's not actually returning a list anymore, so the pickle can't pickle it. Um, but other than that, I'd, I'd have to see the code and play with it. It's going to be too hard to answer. It could be a few things. But um, so we've had, we have had to change some of the data structures in Python 3 for pickling for multi. This is, I guess, this is for multi processing or something, where you're doing the pickling, or a variety of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pick Pickling is a, 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 a funny art. There are some um, pip modules that can pickle objects that the standard library can't. They tend to be slow, um, but they work because they have to be more recursive and pickle things, and it can be expensive. But you could um, check some of them out. Some pip modules could maybe help you get there. But I would then probably look at redesigning my sort of data um, structure, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is more of an architectural question, but any specific reason why you went with Python rather than something like Node? Uh, the, a lot of, so a lot of these projects were already written in Python. Uh, Node wasn't really a big thing back in the early 2000s, I guess, when, when Facebook sort of started. So when you get 
uh, a big common code library up and running, you sort of stick with it. Um, so I guess, you know, Facebook for, you know, this microservices world is an old company. What are we now, 11 years old or 12 years old or something? So it's just a lot of legacy from being back, and you don't want to rewrite these things if you don't have to. So people have just picked up Python and sort of come become the standard for a lot of these back-end smaller services and, and automation. So Node's just not big at Facebook. I, I don't know why. That's not true. Adam, Adam is completely Node. Um, but we, that's all done in the open. But internally at Facebook, we just don't really have Node. So that's predominantly why. If we had more Node, I'm sure uh, there'd, be, there'd be more things written in Node. We're 14 years old. We're what, sorry? 14. Oh, OK. See, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 2004. I can math. <laughs> I mustn't have imported uh, division right, because you need division for that. Hi. Um, Hello. Uh, so it's not really a question. I just want to update you on the cricket score. Uh, your guys have lost five wickets since you last checked. <laughs> All right, give him the prize. All that shit. Uh, I got to watch that tomorrow now. A lot of beers. Hi there. Um, I was just got a question about, um, I think you did touch on it in the presentation, the, the GIL. Um, has that actually improved between Python 2 and Python 3? Because we were kind of burnt by that in terms of threading. The, the what, sorry? The global interpreter lock. Uh, uh, you did yep. touch on it in your presentation. Yep. Um, did how, that... how, how exactly have you been burnt? Like a slight, exa what's a slight example there? Uh, so the thing just didn't, didn't really scale, you know, we, we tried to introduce threads and um, it didn't speed up, you know, so obviously it was just locking um, at that level, which I think is a, a normal yeah. symptom so of, of the GIL. Yeah, there's only a few ways to get around it, like to sort of scale more. Threading, because of the, the nature of how Python threads work, if you're hitting the gill because of long I.O. operations or something, threading's never going to help you. Uh, you're going to have to refactor your code to either multi-process, yeah. go to async I.O., uh, or write C extensions or Cython extensions that can go around the gill and you can say, hey, I'm just going to do a lot of CPU work here. Please don't hold the gill while I do this. So you've sort of got C extensions to go out and live to. I know it's kind of cheating. Um, uh, Async I.O. can sort of allow you to do the coroutine thing, but once again, it depends um, if you're completely I.O. bound or it's small CPU, a big CPU operation that's holding, that can sort of hold the gill. Um, but it's a refactor of how you're doing it. Threads, threads are never going to help you there, unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, saying it's kind of the same problems that we had in Python two will still manifest. Oh, that's it. Uh, so the gill design in Python three is identical, pretty much. Um, okay. There is a project called the Gillectomy from a former Facebooker, um, uh, <laughs> uh, from a former Facebooker who's sort of freelancer now. Uh, he's been working on it for a few years. He can't get when he turns the gill off. He's already got code where he turns the gill off and makes Python able to hammer CPU cores yeah, and be yeah. more like. Uh, you know, like a Go or something in that regard. Um, but he can't get it in when it's single, in single gill, like single threaded, yeah, yeah. Uh, to be as fast as with the gill on. Okay. Uh, all the extra locks that he has to throw everywhere yeah. uh, add a lot of overhead to C Python and makes it actually slower. Okay. So Guido has said publicly that he will never accept the gillectomy diff until that runs on par with the gill on and off. Okay, all right. Well, thanks a lot. But hopefully we get it for Python 4.0. It'd be kind of cool. But then you're going to find how bad Pythonistas are at using locks and mutexes and things to safely guard things because we just don't do it because we get the gill for free. You'll see that if you ever write Python C extensions and you try and take the gill but you don't with writing a C extension and then you'll blow up and seg fault. We get that a lot at Facebook. <laughs> uh, Cooper and I will be at the drinks at Moyo tonight, paid for by Instagram, uh, so you can ask more later.